gentlemen, welcome back. May I ask you to very good, take your seats, please, so that we can continue with um, our keynote session. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome today morning here business leaders <coughs> from across Europe, from North, South, Central Eastern Europe, um, with great stories to tell. Um, our first speaker will be Maximo Ibarra, CEO of KPN, followed by Franco Bassanini, Chairman of Open Fiber, Alison Kirkby, President and CEO of the TDC Group, Martin Vlatchek, who is an Investment Director at PPF and is the Chairman of the Super Supervisory Board of Cetin, and last but not least, Gervais Pellissier, who is Orange Group Deputy CEO, as well as the Chairman of Orange Spain. Um, with that, I would like to invite Maximo to make his opening presentation. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, welcome welcome to, to everyone, to the, to the Netherlands. I'm now becoming more and more Dutch, as I've now been living for quite a long time in, in the Netherlands. Um, I will start with, um, with a very, I mean, easy chart and this is about uh, how this market is. You know that very well because you have been listening to our minister, Mona Kaiser. Um, this is a country where uh, throughputs, speeds, when it comes to access, is particularly developed. Uh, the average 4G throughput is uh, 42 megabit in a country, which is quite high compared to our European countries. And, and when it comes to fixed broadband, 88% of the population is already uh, 100 megabit. Of course, this is a very regulated market. Um, recently, there has been an additional regulation on cable. There is infrastructural competition, lots of regulation. I also have to say that 10 years ago, our fiber, fiber in KPN, was less regulated than what it is right now. So 10 years ago, there was less regulation than today. Uh, it's, of course, a very competitive market. Uh, there has been uh, some developments recently, the uh, merger uh, of uh, Tele2 and uh, T-Mobile in the Netherlands, but it remains very competitive. As you can see, in 2018, in the first three quarters of the year, uh, Europe has been slightly growing, 0.3%, even though it's practically nothing. But in the Netherlands, that performance has not been particularly attractive. It was minus 2%. Recently, we introduced to all stakeholders and uh, financial markets our plan, our strategy. This strategy is very simple. The foundations are just uh, three, three pillars, three main pillars. The number one is about building the infrastructure. So we are an operator. We work in the telecom space. So we decided to accelerate all the investments in infrastructure. It's, of course, not only mobile, but it's in particular fiber to the home. KPN has been the pioneer in the fiber to the home journey in 2008 when we uh, had the joint venture with Reggae Fiber. And um, that is something that now we are enhancing. We are just accelerating because we believe that that is the way forward. There is no any other way forward, as Ronan explained in the keynote speech, at the opening keynote speech. Uh, if we have the right infrastructure, then the logical consequence is point number two. And point number two is that we really believe in convergence. Customers are currently looking for it. They don't call it convergence because it's quite a weird word. But what they want is just a one-stop shopping experience, <coughs> which means that they want to have their mobile, their fix. It's a seamless experience. And they recognize that this ultra broadband can come from two sides, but in the end, it's just the same network. This is the way customers perceive that. And one-stop shopping does not mean only connectivity, but it means at the same time media, yes, please. TV, ultra-definition TV, and more and more connected homes. So the concept of connecting homes is now finally becoming one of the most important uh, things that customers are recognizing are important for their development in the digital society. And the third one is just how can we improve our operational business model to make sure that everything will happen at the right pace, with the right speed, uh, without wasting any time. So we are just simplifying the operational model. We are digitizing everything that we can digitize. So our backend infrastructure, IT platforms, all touch points with customers are becoming more and more digital. And that will, of course, 
give the possibility to KPN to make sure that the infrastructure will be rolled out and developed in the right timing and customers will enjoy convergent services. Uh, these are just a few numbers of the plan. Of course, you need to put these numbers in the context of the Netherlands. Uh, there are 17 million customers, approximately 7.8 million households. Uh, so the plan again is building the infrastructure, fiber to the home, so we are going to add more than 1 million new households uh, connected with fiber, with optical fiber by 2021. And this is not just the end, it's the beginning because we are going to add 1 million by 2021 to the current 2.3 million, but then of course the plan is just going beyond. Of course we set up this plan up to 2021 in particular for the financial markets, but our ambition is to go more, more than that, much more than that. And, and again, uh, in the, the keynote opening speech, I think that Rona was particularly effective in explaining why these two networks are um, or have to work like in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in total consistency with each other. It's not only about the fixed, and it's not only about the mobile. Mobile is not replacing fixed. Fixed wireless is just something that you can play in specific areas, but it's just a combination of the two that make your infrastructure very strong. And that's why we are also going into a full modernization of the network as many other players. And that modernization of the network is important because that has to be 5G ready. Then, of course, in terms of regulations, in terms of government efforts, we have to make sure the spectrum is going to be available in the Netherlands for all the different bad winds as soon as possible. And again, moving to all IP, this is not just only like a claim, but this is reality. It's moving ISDN, PSDN into IP connections. So that migration has to happen again in a very short time from now. Um, fiber. Um, we are also here, right? I mean, some, sometimes we have been using to call fiber everything that is not fiber in reality. So the fiber to the corner, fiber to the curve, that is not real fiber. It's just stretching copper to an extent that you can get tactically the right kind of experience today. But if we are just moving forward and we look at the next five, seven, ten years, that doesn't make any sense. We need just to migrate into fiber to the home. And it's not only about the one gigabit, as we already mentioned earlier this morning but it's about getting up to 10 gigabit. And fiber to the home is already demonstrated. It's a much more efficient technology compared to any other technology. So if we really want to move forward as a company, and it's not only business-wise, but it's also in terms of the society, the role that we are playing in the society, and how all different stakeholders and parties can play this game to make sure that finally we are going to have a lot of growth coming from fiber development. Yeah. Uh, PON, g -pon technologies is, is going to offer this possibility. So superior technology, as I mentioned, 10 gigabit. Again, so the, the, the one gigabit is really the starting point, but the development is much farther than this. Lower total cost of ownership, I mean efficiency, uh, enabling on-demand activation, and at the same time, lower energy usage. So sustainability is also an important target when it comes to fiber to home rollout. And uh, by 2021, what we expect is that uh, yeah, more than 45, approximately 45% of the households in the Netherlands will enjoy fiber to the home experience. And uh, at least 75% of households will have more than 200 megabit. So we are just really working in order to improve the whole footprint to make sure that connectivity is not going to be any issue and there's not going to be any hassle for customers. That is uh, the way we represent the Netherlands. Um, just try to figure this out. It's, it's like by 2021, of course, the large cities are going to be connected fiber to the home. What does it mean? It means that in dense urban areas, we need to have that technology in place. Otherwise, all these dreams on what you can do in terms of connectivity are not going to happen. Again, it's a combination between 5G and fiber to the home that will enhance, enable all these new applications that will come soon. In the rest of the country, as we cannot, I mean, roll out everything 100%, because also we have to look at the Roshi, the return on capital expenditure, but also we have to look at all the investments that we are going to make in the future. It's going to be a combination of technologies. Maybe in some areas it makes sense to keep and stretch a little bit our fiber to the corner, but also in some other areas, in rural areas, where there is not the right density, then we can play with some fixed wireless substitution. In this moment, we are just deploying in some rural areas in the Netherlands, <coughs> hybrid technologies, which is the VDSL plus 4G. Tomorrow will be VDSL plus 5G or fiber to the home, depending on the different demand that we can collect in different areas. We also see that in some rural areas, customers are really willing 
to pay more to get the state-of-the-art future-proof technology. Uh, what can we do all together? Again, this is not only an objective of a company. Of course, we are just business leaders running companies that have to be profitable in the future because we need to guarantee the right return to shareholders. But at the same time, we have a duty when it comes to society. And uh, we cannot play this game if we are just simply alone or we have only like announcements that everything is going to be simplified. We really need to work uh, and to work hand in hand to make sure that everything will happen at exactly the same pace that customers are expecting. They are not waiting for uh, something happening all of a sudden. They're just really willing to have that kind of experience right now. So what can we do? What local governments, what the government can do? Uh, again, on top of the uh, kind of uh, predictable regulation framework in the future, so we need to understand in the next five years, seven years, as we are going to deploy a lot of investments in this market, really huge amount of money is going to be invested in the role of the fiber. What do we really expect from regulations? So are we going to get some additional, like, uh, new breaking news that are going to disrupt a little bit our plans? Yes or not? So we need to have that predictable uh, framework. But on top of that, there are some other few things that can be done effectively. Here you can just read some of them. Uh, we need to allow the sweet face out of legacy infrastructure. So the moment we just switch off copper, what are the costs related to switching off copper? Um, how can we lower costs when it comes to permits and fees? That, I mean, is the best way to allow us to make sure that our investment can have the right return. And also, again, the pace and the uh, speed of execution of our infrastructure allowed. Uh, surely times for approval, construction licenses. You know that more than 70% of the total cost that we have on uh, uh, rolling out and connecting homes is, is just because of construction. So we have to make sure that, okay, when we get a license cons for construction, that, that happens in a relatively short time. One stop shop for procedures. Just only one procedure, not many. So then in that case, we have the chance to really work on the right framework. And make procedures uniform is the harmonization of legislation. Every, everywhere in the country has to be the same. And I think that every single state member of the European Union should work in exactly the same kind of direction. Um, 5G uh, and fiber to the home will really make uh, companies that are operating this sector, infrastructural companies, really at the center of the ecosystem. There will be a lot of economic growth. So this is an undisputed concept. It's really common sense. If we really want these countries, European Union, of our European Union to keep growing, we need to build infrastructure. Without it, we are not going to get anywhere. Uh, households. I mean, customers are not expecting complicated stuff. But they're just following what, I mean, uh, is, is really happening. We, I'm not talking about virtual reality or augmented reality. This will happen, by the way. So smart working experience is going to definitely change. But I'm talking about uh, ultra broadband uh, TV definition. I'm talking about connected homes, security. All these new devices, stuff, and services are coming up in order just to feed up and to increase and improve the convergent proposition. And then, of course, on the cities and people. So how can we uh, make sure that smart cities are just not only like an advertisement claim, but becomes reality? And the gigabit infrastructure can really attract businesses. Again, our plan is not only building uh, just for households and, and, and for businesses. It's just really about people. And I always like saying that the moment we roll out fiber, I would love to have all the households, business parks, powered by KPN. So you have, if I had the chance to really have like a, I don't know, a plate in each single house in this country that says powered by KPN, it means that we will be really helping customers to be part, an active part of this gigabit society. Again, just so uh, my final remark, uh, our objective, our mission, our vision, and our real ambition is to make sure that we can really build the digital highways of the Netherlands. And uh, there is no any other alternative option. We are going to do that, and we are going to do that with the help and support of all stakeholders, government and local governments, and to make this like a very successful journey. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Maximo. Um, 
um, as, as you mentioned, I think in, in the future, indeed, new technologies will need fiber absolutely everywhere. Um, and I wonder whether there is a particular kind of strate strategy or kind of thought uh, leadership within KPN as regards how you are preparing for a converged future. Um, and also if you have any expectations with regards how convergence will actually impact on demand and how demand will evolve in a converged world. Yeah, definitely. I think this is the, the, the most relevant question because in the end, we are just building uh, all everything that we are building with the only purpose to make sure that customers get a benefit and, and tangible benefit, it's a material benefit. So that's why uh, when, when we decided to go um, quite straightforward into the convergent proposition, what we immediately thought is that, yeah, convergence is not only putting together mobile and fixed because this is something that customers already take for granted. They are just expecting that. Um, and they know very well that the throughput, latency, and capacity will improve over time. So they just want to make sure that they are on a very reliable infrastructure. They're just not waiting for, uh, oh, maybe, yes, no. They want to make sure that they are on a reliable infrastructure. Having said that, what we are now planning is just, okay, how can we enhance our proposition? Mm -hmm. and, and the first point of that is, is the famous IoTs, mm -hmm. connected homes. Mm -hmm. I just hate saying IoTs because that doesn't mean anything, but connected homes means something more. It's like the robo cars are becoming connected cars. Mm -hmm. um, and on that front, there are many things that we can do. Most of the things are nice to have in this moment, but are becoming in some parts of the population a must to have. I mean, we are talking about security cameras, yeah, we are talking also about how can we make sure that customers can enjoy seamlessly the opportunity to benefit from over the tops just in a very easy way, plug and play. Uh, how can we make sure that there is no hardware when it comes to modems, Wi-Fi routers, because it's already on the cloud? Uh, how can we also play with new services that are more, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the virtual reality and augmented reality? That there are propositions that, of course, are now coming up but our real intention is to make sure that everything that we launch in the market is going to be material, the customers can, can really touch it, and they can keep like, improving their package. By the way, feeling very satisfied because they are on a very reliable infrastructure. So that's our whole uh, intention. Last but not least is the user experience. Everything we do can be very complex, but if we don't have plug and play, as I said, one-stop shopping, if we don't have the right user interface, <coughs> right interoperability with the applications, now that we all have these applications, we tend to have many of them rather than having just only one. If you really can manage all your services with just very intuitive user interface, that will be absolutely super winning. Great, thank you very much. We will return to these crucial issues in the discussion later yeah. on. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, just invite uh, Franco Bassanini to deliver his opening remarks. Thank you, Edward. Uh, this morning, I downloaded <coughs> on my PC the program of the 2010 FTTH Council Conference held in Lisbon. The comparison with the program of our today's conference is impressive, starting with the participants in the keynote session. In Lisbon, the largest operator in the panel was Portugal Telecom, while the others represented potential future users. The focus was still on convincing the participant of the benefits of deploying fiber to the home. In less than 10 years, as we know, the telecommunication landscape has dramatically changed. As for the infrastructure sector, in comparison with 2010, I see three main evolutions. First, there is no longer a need to argue in favor of deploying fiber to the home. Nobody challenges that investing in fiber networks is a crucial need for growth and jobs and for the European competitiveness in the global economy. Digital transformation, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, smart cities, and so on, require fiber. Today, the question is no longer if, but when. Today, many national policies do not focus only on fiber to the home, but include fiber to the cabinet. But in the new code, the European Union has now indicated optical fiber 
as the point of reference for very high capacity networks. The Juncker Commission is promoting very high capacity networks by its gigabit uh, society objectives, and several member states' governments are doing the same. Second, in 2010, fiber to the home deployment was still a very early stage, except in few countries like Portugal and Lithuania. Today, fiber to the home deployment has become mainstream. Thirdly, since uh, 2010, the most remarkable the development is the emergence of wholesale only operators. The wholesale only model has attracted new players all over the, Uni the, United the European Union. Last year, the European Union has acknowledged formally the benefits of the wholesale only business model and the fact that uh, it is uh, better placed to attract long term investments in the new infrastructures. The new European Code has suggested and authorized the national regulatory authorities to provide a lighter regulatory regime in favor of wholesale only operators, even when these operators enjoy significant market power. Let us now imagine our successor in 2025, looking back at the program of this conference. Let us distinguish between what we can already predict and what will depend on factors and circumstances which cannot yet be anticipated. Let us start with certainties. First, the implementation by the national governments and regulators of the European Electronic Communication Code will provide for a positive regulatory framework for the development of fiber to the home networks in Europe. Important are, meanwhile, the guidelines that the Berec is to issue in the coming months over a number of aspects of the utmost relevance for the market, starting from the definition of very high capacity networks. Like everywhere, the devil is in the details. Berec will have to provide a common identification of the network termination point and of the first concentration and distribution points, a common approach to the co-investment and to geographical surveys of network deployment. Second, 5G will boost the deployment of FTTH networks. Operators who deploy fiber to the home are able to deploy dense fiber networks also for 5G at marginal cost. Already in 2016, the European Commission highlighted the interplay between fiber and wireless deployment requirements and called for coordination between the actors as for investment in cellular base station and fiber infrastructure. Recent researches show that the synergies between the FTTH and mobile 5G networks can be very significant and can lead to huge savings in CAPEX especially if these, if these synergies are considered from the beginning in the construction of greenfield infrastructural projects. Third, the wholesale only model will further gain traction. There are different reasons to believe this. First of all, as a wholesale only operator is not active on the retail market, it has no conflict of interest with activities on the latter. Moreover, normally we'll sell only operators do, do not have copper legacy networks and only focus on the deployment of new fiber to the home infrastructures, which are less costly to manage. In addition, building fiber to the home infrastructure requires considerable time and medium long term investments. We'll sell only operators are better placed to mobilize investors specialized in the asset class of greenfield infrastructural projects who are attracted by lower risk and RIV modeling. If you look ahead, the model will benefit from another important evolution of the market. In the next years, players active on the telecom market will multiply and diversify. Producers and distributors of audiovisual products, such as Sky, OTTS, such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, energy, gas, and water distribution companies, insurance companies. It is highly probable that these new players will prefer 
dealing with wholesale-only operators, allowing more flexibility for the service the new players intend to provide, and guaranteeing fairer competition among all players involved than vertically integrated operators. Let's now finally move to the uncertainties. The first factor of uncertainty is whether regulators will succeed in fostering the switch off of copper networks and the consequent migration to FTTH networks. Agreed medium term timetables for the switch off region by region would definitely accelerate the development of FTTH networks. However, while in some countries like, Sp like in Spain, the incumbents themselves have decided to focus on FTTH, in other countries, reliance on the existing copper networks is still seen as a medium term strategy for the deployment for the deployment of very high capacity networks. These operators are betting on technological developments such as uh, GFAST vectoring and so on, that boost the connectivity of fiber to the cabinet networks. But the adoption of these technologies is not easily compatible, compatible with the need to ensure full equivalence of input uh, among all the service providers as requested by several NRS. And in any case, even in the best case scenario, GFAST and vectoring can only represent short-term solution, which will not be able to satisfy the more demanding connectivity needs of the gigabit society. The second question, Mark, relates to the market support. Will consumers subscribe to FTTH networks which provide better services and are thus more expensive than copper connection. In several countries, the demand could be weak due to adverse marketing practices on the side of some incumbents, such as anti-competitive pricing policies and misleading advertisement. As national governments did to promote the take-up of digital terrestrial television, they will have to develop schemes to support the migration of end users to FTTH networks, such as vouchers to families and SMEs. The third question mark relates to the digital policy objectives that will be set, set by the future European Commission. As mentioned, setting the gigabit society's objectives contributed to render FTTH deployment mainstream. Will the next Commission pursue this policy? Will the next commission follow the trend of the leading counties and set the 10 gigabits as the next objective? Finally, the fourth question relates to the usage of economies of scope and scale. Parallel deployment of FTTH and 5G networks, except in very dense city areas, is not the most effective way to spend scarce resources. The FTTGA Council Europe study on the convergence between fixed mobile networks shows that converging both networks in order to have a single infrastructure capable of offering all possible services, both at fixed and at mobile level, is not only the most economical rational option, but also the only one that allows us to enjoy the benefits of countless new services as soon as possible. But will operators reach agreements for joint deployment and other network sharing formulas? Will regulators accept operators merging their networks into a single network company? To conclude, a broader reflection begins to take shape and is already developing in some countries, such as the US and Italy. The global technological competition, which is in progress, is also played on the ground of telecommunication infrastructures. Several countries, China above all, have strongly accelerated the, real the realization of future-proof infrastructure, FTTH, 5G, edge cloud computing, through the allocation of huge amounts of public resources and the power to strongly coordinate the investment of private actors. How can the Western countries face this competitive challenge? 
Is the infrastructural competition among private operators the most suitable model to compete? Are the virtues of the free competition among private players enough to compensate for the lack of coordination, the ineffective duplication of investments, and the natural short-term vision of private investors reluctant to finance long-term greenfield projects? Or should the states promote or incentivize the consolidation of telecommunication infrastructures, or even the development of a single double-sided network, FTTH 5G, capable of mobilizing the long-term public and private investments needed to accelerate the deployment of the latest generation network throughout the country, guaranteeing absolute equality of treatment to all service providers according to the wholesale-only model? Or at least could this, this be the best solution for market failure areas in order to quickly reach universal coverage of the FTTH and 5G double-phase network. The pros and cons of the two solutions, infrastructural competition versus a single will sell only infrastructure, must be careful weighed. I do not have an answer, but the question is now on the table. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Franco. Let, let me ask you uh, um, about a, a quite heatedly debated question related to, to the Italian market. So there is quite a lot of discussion about and speculation whether or not Telecom Italia and open fiber might be merging. Mm. Um, is this something that you, as the chairman of open fiber, would actually expect to happen um, anytime soon? I, I, I Sorry, um, uh, there is quite a bit of speculation in the Italian market about a potential merger between Telecom Italia ah. and Open Fiber. Yes, as, uh, as you know, it's a bit the, the current Italian government, but also the previous mm. ones, uh, explicitly declared the intention to favor a sort of remonopolization of the TLC ultra broadband network through a merger between the network of the former incumbent Telecom mm -hmm. Italia and the new fiber network of, uh, of open fiber mm -hmm. in a single network held and managed by a non-vertically integrated operator according to the wholesale only models. Mm -hmm. This is the intention. The parliament has established recently that the merger could be favored by some incentives decided by the National Regulatory Authority, mm -hmm. but at the condition that this will be in a, in a, a wholesale only uh, operators. Such move uh, would reduce the risk of inefficient duplication of investment in most dense areas, and no investment at all in less dense and rural areas. Uh, a single operator served in the world market of retailers would have all the incentives necessary to extend coverage and guarantee a geographically average access price, favoring the development of a strong competition among service providers. But it is clear, however, that the project could only be carried out with the consent of the shareholders of the two companies concerned, mm -hmm. or at least of their majority. And so the issue is now the subject of a lively discussion among the shareholders of the incumbent Telecom Italia and among the shareholders of Open Fiber. Uh, the outcome is not predictable. The alternative could be the <coughs> merger in a single wholesale only company only of the assets useful for the full deployment of the FTTH infrastructure and eventually of the 5G backbone, with agreements assuring a gradual migration from the hybrid to the fiber networks. What I can exclude is a consolidation, is a consolidation of the different networks within the incumbent, which would, in my opinion, face insurmountable obstacles 
in the light of the Italian and the European competition laws. Thank you very much. Undoubtedly, the discussion will continue. Uh, uh, may I just move on to Alison Kirkby? Alison, would you like to make your opening statement, please? Do you need us? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Uh, hopefully, you can see me above this tall podium. Um, I have recently uh, transitioned uh, from CEO of a challenger mobile operator to CEO of an incumbent, uh, which is a significant market player across all technologies, actually, except for fiber. Uh, so I have to wonder whether some fiber companies uh, are on the same path from challenger to market leader. And in fact, I actually feel that we're a challenger in fiber in Denmark today, uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to shed some light on, on some of the dynamics that's going on in Denmark during this conference. It's certainly a very interesting time uh, to be in this industry. Uh, and I'd like to outline some of the issues that we have faced and are now addressing at TDC Group in Denmark. First, some context. TDC was acquired uh, just under a year ago by a consortium of investors. The majority shareholder is the international infrastructure investor, Macquarie Infrastructure and Real Assets, along with three leading Danish pension funds, which are also major infrastructure investors in their own right. We are still in the process of finalizing our strategies and our organizational setup, but we are very much accelerating towards full network separation already this summer, and accelerating our investments into fiber. In fact, yesterday we announced the name of our OPCO, uh, our new digital service provider, which will be called New Day. But let's go back to fiber. As fast, stable, and secure internet connectivity is an integral part of our daily lives, digital infrastructure has become as important to societies as water, electricity, and heating. And to future-proof European digitalization and connectivity, we strongly believe that wide-scale fibre deployment will be required. Many incumbents to date have chosen to upgrade existing networks as it has been difficult to attract the capital for digital infrastructure investments with time horizons for returns of 15 plus years. This has also been the case for TDC, which was very much a cable television-led telco, telco, and had recently upgraded its coax network to deliver gigabit connectivity, thereby prolonging the life cycle of its existing networks. Integrated telcos have traditionally been perceived as risky investments, and given the fierce competition, a heavily regulated market, and very much checks on mergers and consolidations, investors have started to look elsewhere for better returns, and rightly so based on the recent returns that the sector has delivered here in Europe. As pension funds and private equity funds and investors in general have faced a challenging environment to achieve the growth from their investments in recent years, they have started, and particularly pension funds, they've sought out utility-style <coughs> sectors to secure long-term steady returns and are taking direct investments, just as we've seen in Denmark. And since fibre investment requires a notoriously long-term perspective, the utility-like perspective is reflected in fibre operators as well, and this is adding to the mutual attraction. Furthermore, we are seeing a significant government demand and consumer demand for high-speed broadband connectivity in Denmark, which we believe will only accelerate. I believe, and my owners believe, that these developments together are a forceful driver for fibre investment and fibre rollout across Europe. And it's these factors combined that are the reason why TDC has now fully embraced a fibre strategy, even if it does look a little bit late in some areas. Which brings me to separation and the wholesale only model. Integrated telcos have often had to navigate complexities as a result of containing two essentially very different businesses, a broad and diverse range of employees 
and very disparate risk profiles. The retail side of the business is increasingly comp competing and sometimes converging with platform service providers that move fast and break things. And a competitive response requires investment into digitalization and incredible speed and agility. The average age of our OPCO, or as we now call it, New Day, is actually about the age of 30 across our 6,500 employees. The infrastructure side of the business requires a long-term investment horizon and the ability to streamline operations, minimize costs, and deliver steady progress over a very long haul and recognize that it is delivering critical national infrastructure for our governments. And the average age of our NETCO team is around 50. So very, very different businesses. To increase our ability to do these things simultaneously and succeed at both, our owners have decided to separate into a wholesale only and, and a customer focused entity, or as I'm saying, Netco and now New Day, as we have called them so far. By doing so, each entity can focus with laser-like precision on their core capabilities and ambition for the future with the appropriate business mindset and the appropriate time and investment horizon embodied into both. For our NETCO, it's easier to meet the significant increase in demand and maximize fiber deployment by quickly scaling up our fiber rollout, ramping up fiber production, digging and mobilizing investments for the long run. We can now do this in an uncompromising way without the quarterly expectations from our shareholders and the markets in general, in order to subsequently offer open and carrier neutral wholesale access and get maximum utilization from our infrastructure with a sound long-term return from the investment. So with the separation, investment takes on both the risk profile and the return requirements tied to infrastructure. This is very much the business strategy in line with our owner consortium's focus on infrastructure investment. The same logic applies to our OPCO New Day. OPCO's focus is to deliver the best customer experience via our offerings and our services. Technological evolution has made it much easier to develop relevant and agile solutions for our customers through customized and on-demand digital services. And our new OPCO has a role to play in aggregating all of the services that enable a digital life for individuals, households, and enterprises across Denmark. And their purpose is to purely focus on making sense of technology in a digital way. Speed and innovation is essential for the consumer facing market. And our, our OPCO organization has to work with speed in this shorter time horizon so that we can separate the OPCO benefits and really focus on bolder and more risk taking at digital style investments. This very much falls in line with a trend towards transition from linear to on-demand TV consumption, which our separation will position us perfectly for. We are also enabling consumer choice, where our customers can compile their own a la carte lineup of TV channels and on-demand services, such as Netflix and HBO Nordic through our content packages. <coughs> and they can mix and match it by the month or by the week, dependent on what which is the latest show that they want to watch. The separation logic ties in neatly to, to preferences from policymakers, regulators and customers, <coughs> all of which call for competition at the service level. And our new streaming product that now has Premier League football, so I will be able to watch Man United when I'm in Copenhagen, we will, serve, we will sell that streaming product to all service providers in the country. They don't need to be a UC customer to get it going forward. 
We fundamentally believe that going forward, the logics of investment in infrastructure with long-term secure returns and the need for faster, riskier bets on consumer-facing markets will drive other telcos towards separating their operations. These are two different vehicles with differing risk profiles from an, from an investment point of view. For TDC, mixing the DNA of an integrated telecom doesn't make sense for us going forward. And we are truly excited about the future prospects for both parts of our company. These developments are evolving around a relevant backdrop of broader technological and sectoral trends. The telecom sector will be engaged in two major races over the next decades, fiber rollout and delivering on 5G networks, two races that are linked. From a telecom operator perspective, I see fiber and 5G networks as supplementary, not complementary. 5G connectivity will be a wireless additive to fiber networks, but fiber forms the backbone as an enabler for 5G. Hence, 5G rollout is likely to be a strong driver for fiber demand and investment. Perhaps in the long run, the very long run, 5G, 5G may become a substitute for fiber deployment, but only in some areas. Our task in the foreseeable future will be to get fiber as close to as many households as possible. And in some areas, 5G may act as virtual fiber or air fiber for the last mile. But other technologies can serve the last mile as well, so we need to keep an open mind toward this. What I haven't seen much analysis of is the question of whether we should expect overlapping 5G networks or the option of nationwide consolidation leading to one wholesale only 5G network as a shared resource and co-investment opportunity. If we take the case of Denmark, does it really make economic sense to develop three national 5G networks for five and a half million people? Or will the industry and policymakers opt for a single shared network? Maybe it will make sense for macro sites, but does it also make sense for the micro sites? One thing we know for sure is that 5G networks will be demanding to build and expensive, and for the immediate future, we should not expect 5G coverage nationwide. So in summary, the demand for high-speed access is on the rise for governments and consumers and enterprises. And incumbent telcos like ourselves have no option but to invest in the next generation technologies of fiber and 5G. For us at TDC, having owners with a longer term investment horizon and a belief that utility style returns will be possible over the long term is encouraging us to accelerate separation of our network so we can wholesale high speed technologies to all and separately build a customer-focused aggregator of digital service provisions uh, for the future. So it is no mean feat. I'm glad I'm doing it in Denmark because it's uh, a lot smaller than many other markets that my colleagues uh, run. Uh, but we are truly excited about the potential that we are creating for Denmark as a country but also for our employees and our owners going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, and congratulations to launching New Day. Um, it's obviously a very, very exciting period for you. Um, I, um, I, I look at this with uh, this development of separation with quite some curiosity. Um, there has been quite a lot of skepticism about separation of uh, network and services, um, and also even more broadly wholesaling um, a network over the last few years. And, and now there seems to be a trend towards separation, towards wholesale only um, operators emerging. So I wonder why do you think uh, suddenly this is becoming so attractive for investors and then why now? Well, I think there, uh, there is a deep frustration in the public markets about the returns mm -hmm. that they have been able to get from their investment in mm -hmm. telecoms over a number of years. Um, and that's been driven by regulation, 
um, and whatever else, but in a very, very competitive market. Um, but, you know, we have to continue to invest in the infrastructure mm. that supports digital lives. And that infrastructure is costly. Uh, and at the same time, you've got uh, new forms of capital increasingly mm. coming from infrastructure funds, pension funds, that just have a very, very long-term horizon mm. uh, and are starting to view the telecoms infrastructure as a potential utility of the future. And, and they see that as an opportunity and we as a company, we need that investment. Mm. Uh, you know, TDC was going down a route of choosing to invest in content. Mm. Our shareholders clearly didn't like that option and they voted with their feet. But TDC was very, it was very cornered because it couldn't invest with its current ownership at that time in both fiber and content and digitalization and give the returns that the market expected. So the new owners with that very long-term horizon uh, gives us a new access to capital, but we recognize it will only make sense for them if we open up that infrastructure to all and turn it into a wholesale model. And, uh, and because we have as a company over the last few years heavily invested in digitalization and we have a phenomenal position in entertainment, we can now separate this service-led company that is truly differentiating at the service level uh, and really focus on what it's good at. So that's why it makes sense for us. But I think this, this demand for returns, mm -hmm. this demand to invest, and this uh, new form of increasingly large amounts of capital with a different investment horizon, a lower return on capital is what I think is driving this latest round. Thank you. Um, I will move on to Martin. Martin, you have actually led a company through the separation process, so we'll be very interested in hearing from you about your experiences you. um, and key learnings. Good day. As I was asked uh, in January to share about share with you the separation story uh, of Satin, what we did with an incumbent in the Czech Republic. It will be slightly aside uh, from the main topic of this conference, uh, FTTH rollouts, but I think the separation helped us uh, to respond three very critical questions uh, for FTTH rollouts. How to finance it, how to effectively roll it out, and how to, and this is the most important, how to monetize uh, the thing uh, at the end of the day. Because everything uh, in this world is uh, about the return on the investment. So I try to take you now in the five minutes uh, through the separation story, and I will pick up uh, or focus on points where where I think we, the separation helped uh, the process and uh, the involvement evol of uh, first <laughs> capital investments, um, as, as Alison said, uh, is a utility, is a, is a telco utility, a new kind of utility, can, will be treated like this, uh, and uh, helped definitely uh, the infra or netco uh, company, which is called Setin, uh, helps to uh, make clear vision and perspective uh, how to build uh, and how to develop uh, the telco infrastructure. But for the beginning, uh, where I come from is uh, the private equity uh, fund uh, PPF, which is a Central European based uh, investment fund. There are size, uh, this is the size, uh, the numbers, what do you see? Uh, this is 2017 numbers. It's present uh, mainly in Europe, but a lot of operations in Asia now and uh, the US. Diverse in activities. Uh, the biggest one is uh, finance, financial services, uh, banking finance, consumer finance, uh, second biggest telecommunication. And uh, 
from the telecommunication, you will be, and I will speak about uh, one, th one country, which is Czech Republic, uh, but there are mobile operators uh, in five other countries. Uh, we acquired from uh, Telefonica in the year uh, 2014, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia, and last year you probably uh, are aware of uh, the acquisition of uh, Central and Southeastern European assets uh, from Telenor. Uh, so these are, this is the stripe uh, through, through Europe. I'm sure you've heard at least uh, the name or maybe uh, the, the basic frameworks uh, of this, which basically brought us, this is, this is already a live model, uh, which Ellison will now, uh, with the team uh, and, and TDC, uh, run through the show and they have to set it up but this is this is how we set it up uh, in in 2015 and we operated for four years I will go from the bottom the setting is the infra part of the company so we moved all the assets into uh, almost of the all of the assets uh, heavy assets uh, physical assets into the setting part uh, the lower part there is a new brand. It's uh, completely separated uh, from everything. Uh, it, it has own, uh, own, own corporate bodies, uh, processes, business plan, PNL. It's operating on the wholesale market, so the operators are our customers. Unlike the O2, which is the, the OPCO, which is based on uh, the relations B2B and B2C uh, customers, uh, and it's taking, uh, taking care of uh, all the supporting systems. There is a part of mobile core, and what is important, there is a spectrum. Uh, all the spectrum remains with uh, O2. Why did this happen? In, in private equity, if, we will, if you know it, or if I take you in the, into the kitchen of private equity, you always have to find a value creation story. Uh, if, if, you, if you want to succeed uh, in this world and in this business. And we based the value creation on two hypotheses. First, we, we noticed the difference between, um, let's say, treatment and uh, evaluating of utilities like gas, electricity, water, compared to, uh, compared to the uh, telco, which is also very capex heavy industry uh, and there was a big gap a big difference uh, between uh, between these uh, in say in the multiples uh, between evaluation of the energy uh, utility and the uh, integrated uh, telco operators so then we said can we by doing Netco, uh, can we be treated as a utility and increase uh, the, the, the value and the financial, uh, financial uh, evaluation of the company? Second, there was relatively low utilization in an uh, in, in, in integrated operator from the third parties. Third parties did not really uh, use uh, the infrastructure. So then we said, if we separate and we make it neutral and just pure wholesale player, do we increase it? Is the utilization be bigger uh, in this case? You have always to have, uh, let's say, safe and, and, and certain back. And the back, back up uh, here was uh, the shareholder, the PPF and its family fund. There is uh, one physical person behind that, um, which behaved very pragmatic and is, 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 is taken as a pragmatic and very value oriented. And there is, as there is a one person, it's also um, very quick, short decision times, quick in decisions, and uh, you can move uh, with the things uh, quite fast uh, forward. The DNA of PPF says something about uh, thinking outside of the box. So PPF did not, in this case <coughs> particularly, did not uh, afraid to go into the, into the situation or into the make step into the world uh, when no one uh, before us uh, did it. And 
My personal belief is uh, what helped us or make it make the life easier in this case was that we did not have a history in uh, in PPF history in telco industry. There were three goals to be uh, to be taken as an advantage and uh, achievements uh, through the separation. This is what also uh, TDCRL uh, mentioned here. Utility and netco by nature is very different uh, in, let's say, the logic of thinking, building up a business plan. The horizon is uh, dramatically different. To, uh, unlike, uh, unlike the OPCO and, uh, let's say, the retail, retail B2B, B2C uh, customers where the horizon is uh, much, uh, much shorter and they, uh, they live, let's say, in sh much shorter cycles, year cycles, uh, yearly cycles. So this is, this is what brought us uh, to, to the situation where we said, if we concentrate and we let the people concentrate on uh, just the core business, means utility and uh, B2B, B2C uh, business. This will very probably help us uh, and help the companies and will bring uh, result and better, uh, and better, uh, better profitability. We were quite sure that if we streamline uh, and uh, we will separate, we get, uh, or the OPCO gets uh, advantage in the regulation, which really did, uh, because most of the regulation remains uh, with, the, uh, with the NETCO. And we were quite sure that financing uh, possibilities, it's private equity uh, world and fund, uh, will will have dramatically different uh, perspectives uh, if we will separate, and this really uh, this really happened uh, then after. Here, I would like to share with you how it, it, it seems to be relatively. It's nice to listen the separation, but uh, it's also nice to uh, to see it as the first look uh, on the management board. If you if you look on this. Uh, this is basically uh, this is basically the network. Just it's foggy by purpose. Uh, just take it's it's very structured. Uh, there is a clear cut uh, in the company. So this was the first look when we when we decided in 2014 uh, that we go deeper into uh, into the uh, idea. But then come. Let's say we came back and uh, we faced uh, the real situations and the real systems. And now it, see, it, it started to be much more complicated. And uh, let's say, as, as uh, here was said, the devil was in the detail. And the devil meant that you have to touch all the assets and say, left or right. You have to touch all the people and say left or right. You have to touch all the relations and, uh, let's say, uh, processes uh, and say at least uh, how do we, uh, do we uh, go on in the process or we will, uh, we will end it up and there will be some uh, intercommunication between uh, the, the two parties. So it started to be much more complicated and then IT came, which is after 25 years of uh, being integrated operator, uh, this probably will be everywhere same. It was a nightmare because uh, you had very complicated uh, things. So we, we knew we were pioneers uh, in, uh, in that. Uh, there were no good examples uh, to copy. And uh, we, had, we suffered all the consequences.
It wasn't just about uh, the IT, it was uh, about the whole uh, complexity of the company. We, what, what we had to do is to convince ourselves, convince people, uh, explain to the people, uh, state the goals properly, and then believe that uh, there is a way. And uh, we were sometimes uh, in the situation like uh, Indiana Jones was uh, on, the, on the bridge, if there was a bridge or not uh, in it. How did it happen? Four years from separation, almost four years uh, today, appeared no critical problems uh, in, uh, in that, in the, in the operation. Opco and Netco are more in the core business. I was on the part of uh, Netco. I um, have to say that we, throughout, we were forced throughout the four years to really clear out and make clear out uh, all the burdens, all the, all the problems, and make very vital and uh, clear strategy, strategy uh, towards uh, or in the, for the future. There is on both sides, there are much bigger teams. Setin was plus 30% people. So we run the show with much higher number of colleagues uh, because we found uh, we need them either to, to sell the, uh, the products, to sell ourselves, or to build and take care of, uh, take proper care of, uh, of the infra because for us the infra was, uh, was uh, let's say, the, the gold, the, the, our, our daily bread, what we live uh, from. And we created value in it. So we made successfully the arbitrage on, uh, on the, the utility uh, pricing. If, if you go from the O2 minus 1 still equals O2, the logic of this graph says value before, uh, this is the first O2, value before, before separation, end of uh, 2014, which is capital market uh, capitalization. We took out setin out of that. Year after year, something after uh, separation, uh, the value was still there in the uh, original original 2.7 billion euros, and there was set in aside, and it was that was uh, the uh, the the value creation. <coughs> so this is this is the story, how we separated, how we created the value, and how we open at the end of the day. The way to the first three points, what I uh, what I mentioned uh, about FTTH, how to make it, how to finance that, because there is a room for financing, uh, definitely, uh, and we more easily finance it uh, if we are uh, separated, or the the Netco company, how to sell it because we have opened up ourselves and we have a neutral, uh, neut we are neutral position. Wholesale operator, and then uh, also how to build it uh, effectively. But this is something what is uh, connected, and we will probably uh, discuss it further more here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. It's, um, it's a truly exciting um, story and a very successful one. Uh, there is something that I'm really curious about, though. Um, you have been a pioneer with regard to network separation and in investing in an originally incumbent um, operator. Um, and then you moved on and you basically shopped um, in Central Eastern Europe and you bought a very, very different portfolio, asset light, mobile only, um, vertically integrated um, operators across the Central Eastern European region from, from Telenor. So I wonder how um, this um, latest shopping spree is fitting um, in with uh, the logic and, and a concept of, of the original kind of setting approach. And, and also, um, how do you see these very different um, companies sort of gel into um, in a way, unified group, a, a telco group, which you are, PPF is effectively building. Mm. 
the sh uh, let's say acquisition and shopping uh, or acquisition of uh, Telenor. Uh, what is what is important in private equity? PPF entered this five years ago. There was no history. I, I say there was very limited knowledge uh, in that. I think three critical factors happened uh, or met uh, and uh, was possible to make Telenor acquisition. First, the success story of separation that was proved uh, the value creation concept. Second, uh, we, PPF, we, we acquired critical level of, uh, let's say, knowledge and comfort in the industry. Uh, and we believe uh, this, is, this is a good industry with good perspectives and some challenges, mm. for sure. And third, we like the, uh, the asset. Uh, so it might be a different story, or it will be, by, by nature, it will be a different story than, uh, than set in. But uh, this is asset uh, for creativity as well. So this is basically, basically the answer. Thank you very much. Um, moving towards a more Western European group of companies, may I ask you, Gervais, to make your opening <coughs> statement? Thank you. Uh, mm. So this is a long session. So, <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, when when listening to my to my colleagues, uh, this reminds me the, the words of uh, John: "My father's house has many rooms." We are all faithful of uh, fiber, but uh, if I look at the models developed by. Uh, the five of us, I think it's quite, uh, it's quite different. Netco, Opco, no separation, uh, wholesale with retail. And I, my feeling when I listen to all this is that all are successful in one way. But what's important in my view for fiber development first and for technology development, this is clearly long-term commitment for capital. This I agree. And this has been one of the issues for those who have started fiber first uh, like us in Orange, we started the first fiber deployment end of 2006 in Slovakia. Then uh, uh, we started with uh, France in 2007. We stopped for one year because the regulator uh, told us we were uh, too early compared to competition and we had to wait for our competitors and to define the regulation. By the way, for me, that's a big issue with digital compared to other uh, utilities is that we, if we just wait for competition, for regulation, uh, 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 to run for uh, uh, the uh, uh, digital progress and success, we will be always late in this continent. Uh, that's at least my, my view. So we should start and then we regulate if there is a need to regulate, like uh, the US or to a certain extent like China, instead of just uh, putting uh, the brakes before the vehicle has started to, uh, to run. Uh, so, long-term commitment in capital, long-term commitment in technology, and this is why, by the way, we are always a little puzzled by this separation of people between, uh, and even uh, uh, scales between the Netco part and the Opco part. I think you have to be very careful that the Netco company are not too far from the real customers, mm -hmm. and that they still continue to invest in technology skills. Uh, uh, we just provided at the last uh, Mobile World Congress a demonstration on a commercial fiber line of 50 gig, uh, gigabit per second in front of the king. Who is responsible for that in the teams? Is that the Netco teams or the service teams? Big question mark. Uh, uh, so we have to be careful. And I think even if there is separation, there should be uh, bridges between the two teams and between the teams because uh, uh, they will enrich each other. You will not define the network of the future if you don't have a view on the service of your future and vice versa. So uh, uh, at least this is our view in Orange. We need to keep uh, both uh, really uh, uh, being able to enrich each other, whatever the uh, uh, separation. Third, uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, commitment. This is a commitment vis-a-vis -vis the uh, 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 development of the infrastructure in a country. We are operating in uh, 31 countries as a retail operator, uh, 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 eight countries in Europe, and every country has a different model. And by the way, when I listen to the word incumbents, they are incumbents who have been successful, other incumbents not so successful. And if I look at uh, uh, our group, there are 
two countries who are just being mobile only. We are far ahead of the incumbent. This is Slovakia. Uh, this is uh, Slovakia. This is Romania and Moldova. So, uh, uh, and other countries where the incumbent remains the incumbent, able to manage what he has to manage for the future. Uh, maybe uh, just uh, 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 a third point. I think there is, and one of the issues for us in Europe, or question mark. I think there is success in deployment of technology when there is a strong political will and at the same time uh, a private interest ready to invest with this political will. By the way, the political will doesn't mean that there is public money put into the investment. That's another topic. But there shall be a strong political will. And for us, this leads me now to the Spanish case. I am also the, I'm the chairman of our own Spain. Uh, uh, why Spain has been uh, attractive to us. For me, uh, uh, by the way, we shall never forget that even if Spain is Latin, uh, uh, the greatest uh, uh, king of Spain, Charles, uh, the great was uh, speaking more Dutch than Spanish. <laughs> uh, 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 everybody forgets it. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what's great in this country is that it is a liberal system. For me, uh, the regulator in Spain is probably the one behaving the most like the US to a certain extent. And what has happened with fiber? The country has this idea that fiber was important. Then has left the incumbent run first to build fiber, not imposing any immediate regulation on the incumbent. But then has pushed others, especially uh, Orange and Vodafone, to say, OK, guys, if you want to take the race, you can. And uh, uh, also creating uh, the uh, overall climate to have uh, urban planning regulation which is adapted to the, teleco re to the telecom regulation. This is what uh, Maximo mentioned. To have also uh, the permits that are in line with the, with the telco regulation laws. And then uh, to have an, an overall uh, picture in the country where there was a race to build infrastructure. And uh, uh, with some competition, there has been uh, uh, sometimes duplication of infrastructure, but at a relatively low price. And at the end, it has uh, uh, put Spain in the situation where it is today, where we are not far from 80% uh, of home pass today in Spain. And ourselves, we are covering today in home pass uh, uh, 16 million households in Spain. And we have 3 million FTTH customers, which is our biggest country with FTTH customers. First, before France, where we have uh, 2.6. Uh, a million FTTH uh, uh, customers today. So for me, the overall uh, uh, climate in Spain has been very positive. And now what's the situation? You have an FTTH network in Spain, which sometimes is competing, sometimes is partnering. We have uh, 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 signed agreements with our three competitors. Uh, we share infrastructure with Telefonica. We share infrastructure with Vodafone. We share infrastructure with uh, MassMobile. Uh, uh, and uh, this works quite well today uh, for the sake of the customers. And when we look at the uh, uh, retail market situation, the churn is between 18 and 22 percent, which means on fiber, which means that there is complete freedom of choice of the customer of their supplier. So uh, all this has created for us a very positive uh, environment. Regarding fiber, we also believe that it's important outside of Europe. We have started to deploy fiber in several uh, African capitals. Uh, uh, we just mentioned Casablanca, uh, uh, Dakar, uh, Bamako, uh, Cairo, and uh, uh, um, uh, Abidjan, uh, where uh, we have now about uh, 150,000 uh, FTTH customers in Africa. It looks small compared to Europe, but uh, we shall never forget that we, we are building fiber in countries where the average RPU is between uh, 3 and 5 euros on mobile, so the ability of people to pay for it is not that big. But we think that uh, for the large uh, cities in Africa, uh, fiber to the home is also uh, a very valuable solution for, for the future. So. Uh, I, I will not say more uh, as, a, as an introduction, but uh, uh, just to say that uh, uh, everybody has his own model, uh, but at the end, what's important is how quickly uh, we uh, develop uh, and deploy those infrastructure, uh, and we can uh, uh, help this continent to catch up with uh, uh, this uh, technology. Thank you very much, Gervais. Um,
I do have a question. Um, I do have a question to you. Um, as, a, as a major um, fiber deployer, um, really leading the race um, in, in uh, France, but, but also very massively in, in Spain, how do you see um, the role of fiber and the possibilities with fiber to actually combat uh, the digital divide, which was, which was mentioned by the State Secretary, um, saying that that's also an objective, a political objective here in the Netherlands, but, but that is a much bigger challenge in countries like France, for example. Um, and, uh, and also, what, what measures could be taken in order to prevent from the outset the emergence of a new fiber divide, if you like? The, the, the situation is, has been treated very differently in Spain and in France. In Spain, this is thanks to competition, but also by uh, 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 letting Telefonica uh, uh, ahead. So w when Telefonica has invested in some rural areas, they have a wholesale price. And for those who want to be uh, to compete against them on the retail, they have to uh, uh, to take their bitstream offer. And so this is, in my view, a fair return given to the one who has built uh, the infrastructure in uh, or is building the infrastructure in. Uh, rural areas. In France, you know, uh, and, and probably there are many people in the room knowing that, the, the country has been divided in three parts. One are the uh, uh, dense areas, about 20% of the French population, where in fact uh, the uh, 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 competition is a full competition except for the vertical uh, uh, wire. So for vertical wire, we have to co-invest with others. The one who is building the vertical wire in a building has to open its infrastructure to others. Then there is a second part, which are the semi-dense areas, about 40% of the population, where in fact there has been a, a kind of function put uh, by the central government on the table to ask to people, are you ready to cover this part or this part of the country? And at the end, Orange, has chosen to cover 70% of this territory, whereas our competitors have chosen 30%, mainly SFR, by the way. And there, there is also a possibility of co-investment, but which is also uh, the co-investment uh, takes care of who is investing first with a kind of increased price for co-investment if you invest once the market has started. And for me, that's very good because at least there is a premium given to the one who has decided to take the risk to cover uh, uh, the area with fiber. You are not so sure that the customer will come. By the way, if I take our uh, fiber uh, network in France, we are today at 12% usage for our own uh, uh, customers, and we had another 10% on all sales, so, which means that you have 20% uh, uh, fulfilling of the uh, uh, network with the uh, customers. And then there is the rest, small towns, rural areas, where the regions I've organized a concession system, so this is in the hand of the regions. This is called a uh, réseau d'initiative publique, in a, in a, a kind of PPA, mm -hmm. uh, where in fact there is a farmer, uh, there is a company that will build and operate the network on a wholesale basis, and then all retail companies will come and buy uh, trenches. Uh, uh, so this is more or less the uh, open fiber system of, uh, of Italy, which is applied in those regions, but region by region and with different operators. We have, uh, I, I have uh, met some of our competitors or, or partners uh, in the room operating on that. Uh, and the system, I would say, is working uh, well or less well because, in fact, the auction uh, is also linked, uh, uh, depending on the regions, there is a kind of pricing, but there is also coverage obligations. There are many things, and some regions have managed it well. Other regions have, been, have not been so uh, 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 good into managing their uh, directions. Let's say it that way. Mm -hmm. Now, based on that, the expectation of uh, the French government is to have, let's say, 85% uh, uh, household coverage in terms of fiber by the end of 2022. So this answers to the uh, digital divide, because we, we believe, by the way, when we started to, uh, to deploy fiber, I remember the most of the requests of the local authorities were for schools, uh, universities, small business, rather than for consumers. Let's not forget that digital divide is so, so mainly linked with how much 
we are able to maintain jobs or create jobs in uh, uh, rural or semi-rural areas rather than just the consumer. I think consumer can handle with a relatively lower speed, but if you want to, smart, uh, to start a small business, uh, uh, let's say uh, in the middle of uh, Normandy or, uh, uh, or Brittany uh, uh, or uh, uh, Burgundy, uh, uh, if you have high speed, very high speeds, then it, it will change completely uh, the game. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have covered a lot of ground. I would absolutely love to continue the discussion, but I'm afraid that we are quite short in time. But I would really encourage you uh, to continue um, the speakers over lunch and later during the breaks, as well as the audience, um, to think about all these issues that were covered in, in today's panel. Um, and I would like to um, thank you for the tremendously interesting contributions.